Hello everyone, I welcome you to the CEC lecture series. I am Nupur Chavla, teaching English literature at Maitri College, Delhi University. And today's lecture is uh, part 2 of uh, the lecture titled Jean-Paul Sartre, No Exit, 1944. And uh, in the previous uh, segment of the lecture, we uh, looked at the background, some of the important uh, details which we need to uh, know in order to better appreciate the text. We understood, uh, uh, you know, the inclinations of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, how he was a playwright who was, uh, you know, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, sharply steeped in uh, ideological concerns. Um, he was a, a playwright who would not, uh, you know, accept things lying down. He would question and that is something which, uh, you know, is uh, evident in his works as well. Uh, the other thing that we said was that he is associated with this cultural movement of existentialism and we discussed what exactly does this uh, cultural uh, movement uh, mean, what are the features of, of existentialism and we also uh, understood that how, uh, you know, um, it's not just a philosophical, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, school of thought in that sense but also is a literary phenomenon too. Because uh, as much as, uh, you know, uh, philosophical works uh, thought about or uh, threw light on uh, existentialism, um, equal contribution was there by uh, the works of literature that also made us think about existentialism per se. Now, in today's, uh, in, in, uh, in this lecture, we are going to uh, discuss uh, the play No Exit written by Sartre. Now, as uh, we also pointed out in the previous lecture that uh, this play was written, uh, you know, soon after Sartre came back to Paris after having been a prisoner of war in the Second World War. So, clearly the date, if you notice, of the play, 1944, is a time when the Second World War is still going on, right? So, this is the context in which uh, Sartre writes this play and uh, also personally this is the time when he, you know, kind of makes a switch where um, he sees that, you know, direct resistance is, uh, is not proving as fruitful. So that's when he starts to devote his time quite seriously to writing literature and uh, to writing these creative works. So it is quite obvious for us to see that his thoughts then now would uh, percolate into his creative expression uh, instead of, uh, you know, just a fine uh, articulation in philosophical terms, right? So, uh, the play, uh, what is the setting? Uh, the setting is uh, that, you know, there's, there's just a single room in which the entire action of the play takes place. It's a room with second empire furniture. What do we mean by second empire furniture? Now, you see, second empire is usually a term which is uh, associated with uh, a rule of uh, uh, Napoleon, Right. Um, so uh, it's uh, uh, and when we call, uh, you know, or when we use the term second empire furniture, so it basically implies that, uh, you know, furniture that was uh, very, very elaborate in aesthetic sense. It was very ornate. Uh, it was not a simple, uh, you know, so to say uh, it, 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 it did not comprise simple fixtures in that sense. So um, your entire play uh, takes place in this one room which has the second empire furniture, the play does not move into any other, uh, you know, locale or setting for that matter. Uh, the other thing which we also must uh, notice about this play is that, um, uh, you know, the, the crux of the play actually lies, uh, I wouldn't say not as much in action, but as much in conversation. So, what the characters say what they talk about, that forms the crux of this, uh, you know, a play. Instead of different scenes, instead of what is happening, instead of the descriptions, etc. Unlike most other drama that you might have read, right? That there are various characters. Uh, the the uh, plot moves from one locale to the other. There is this kind of a transition, and how every uh, you know all of these elements contribute to the central point, which is uh, uh, conveyed by the uh, uh, playwright. But in this case, it's a single room where the action takes place, right? So this also, of course, tells us that how um, you know um, I would say centered or focused would the playwright be 
in uh, communicating what he actually wants to say, right? And uh, what does he want to say? He wants to creatively, imaginatively bring out the idea of existentialism. What did it mean to be, uh, to be an existentialist around the time of the Second World War? Right? So, how does this uh, uh, you know, uh, idea get played out or how does this idea manifest in the text is something that we are going to discuss as we discuss the elements uh, uh, still more at length. But we see that uh, uh, that is the setting of a single room. The other thing that we need to uh, notice are the characters. So, we have just four characters in the play, that is it. The first character is called Joseph Garson. And he is a journalist who lived in the barracks in Rio, that is Brazil, and he died after refusing to fight in an unnamed war, right? So, he is a journalist who refuses to fight in a war. Now, what war is that? Uh, the playwright does not mention, but of course, it is quite obvious. You see, um, 1944, at a time when um, the world war is going on, um, uh, Sartre imagines this character who refuses to be a part of the war, who is a pacifist in that sense, right? So, uh, this automatically tells you uh, that what is the um, a playwright thinking? Is he in favor of war or will he be critical of war, right? So, uh, the characterization itself then also lends meaning to uh, the uh, value system which defined this playwright. And we also see that how Joseph Garson as an individual was unfaithful to his wife, right? Uh, the next character is uh, um, Ines Serrano. Now, she is a gay, a postal uh, clerk. She turned a wife uh, against her husband and uh, she also, uh, you know, is seen twisting the wife's perception of her spouse and the subsequent death of the man who is also her cousin. So, uh, uh, this is the background of Inez Serrano. Uh, she is gay and the fact that, uh, you know, she um, very cleverly, that is what she has done. Now, this is not something which the play uh, shows. The play tells you about this background of the characters, right? Uh, that uh, she uh, actually influenced Inez, uh, influenced the uh, perception of uh, her beloved woman and uh, 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 the perception about her husband and which then ultimately leads to the subsequent death of the man and that man uh, is also uh, Inez's cousin, right? The third character in the play is Estelle Rigaud. Now, Estelle is a high society woman who married an older man for his money and had an affair with a younger man, right? Uh, you might wonder that what is going on. There is uh, uh, not one character seems to be, uh, uh, you know, without a flaw. Uh, I, again, I, I, I don't want to uh, give a value judgment, but definitely we see that these characters have done things that would be unacceptable to society. The first character, uh, you know, uh, uh, Joseph Garson um, refused to be a part of war and he was also unfaithful to his wife, right? He was uh, with, a, with a different woman while already being married. The second character, Inez, this, this uh, woman is gay and she, uh, you know, kind of uh, makes sure that uh, uh, her uh, beloved, uh, you know, somewhat is uh, severed from her uh, actual legal uh, uh, partner. And uh, Estelle is uh, another high society woman who marries a man quite older to her in age for money and uh, along with this marriage she also has an affair with a young man and her lover becomes emotionally attached to her and uh, she actually also bears him a child and then she ultimately drowns that child by throwing it off the balcony into the sea. Now, I am sure, you know, when you, when you look at these characters, it is a very dark world which Sartre is, uh, you know, uh, presenting. Where is this darkness coming from? should be your question. Is it that Sartre was, uh, you know, such a person? These characters or this darkness is coming from the darkness of the times. You see, when everything had seemed to, um, you know, collapse or crumble, uh, when the wars were the center of existence, all the value systems, 
all that which we as humans deem sacred the idea of uh, you know mutuality the idea of um, um, you know honesty the idea of um, uh, you know genuineness all these things seem to have gone out of the window in the lives of these three characters so in the uh, uh, you know in the words of the uh, play they have sinned all three have a sinful past right and uh, uh, the fourth character of course is valet and he enters the room with every character right so all these three characters they one by one enter the room and they are actually brought by valet now who's valet is uh, he's actually uh, i mean we, we we don't really get to know a lot about his background but uh, but the fact that his uncle is a head valet and that he does not have um, also valet does not have eyelids so that is something which is again uh, another very um, absurd thing about this character right so now you might wonder that uh, when these three characters come together with an incredibly sinful past in this one room as you read the play you realize that it also acquires symbolic connotations right how because uh, you know this room then becomes so you see there are multiple interpretations uh, of this uh, 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 this uh, kind of a representation first interpretation is that some people say that uh, you know it's a depiction of the afterlife in which these three deceased character these characters who are dead are actually punished by being locked into a room together for eternity right the fact that these three people are confined to this room there's nowhere for them to go becomes a means of uh, i mean uh, becomes a symbolic representation of what one might call quote and quote hell right so that's one interpretation that this room then becomes a space which is equivalent to a hell because they are going through the consequences of the uh, wrong doings that uh, these three characters were uh, engaged in when they were alive so then this uh, play actually brings to you um the dead people right dead people who are interacting in hell so you see not just the characters but even the setting itself uh is incredibly dark right uh and in fact uh the idea of hell of course also becomes uh, quite crucial which we are going to discuss um, uh slightly ahead um but uh, but you know the other thing which we also need to see is that at one level while this one room is uh, seen to be uh symbolic of um, uh you know this kind of a torture uh, chamber that uh, which is hell where people have to uh, you know kind of pay for uh, the wrong doings that they did while they were alive um on the other hand you see it's um, it also somewhat uh, you know when you when you when you read it closely this room is managed by an authority and that authority is never seen valet is a representative uh, of that authority but who is the ultimate figure of that authority is not known yeah so that's the second uh, symbolic uh, understanding of uh, the situation or this uh, one room uh, that is the inmates and uh, everything that uh, goes on over here is being controlled by another authority and the fact that it is called as a torture chamber or it is uh, represented as a torture chamber then actually tells us that you know how uh, france uh, around this time uh, was living this kind of a hell right uh, during the second world war uh, when germany was the aggressor uh, france uh, you know was going through a tough time so perhaps this can also be seen as a visualization of the political reality uh, by sartre where this torture chamber then becomes the reality uh, of the parisians or uh, or of the french people around that time and the external agency which is uh, you know kind of um, regulating the people and uh, which is regulating the state of affairs in this torture chamber uh, could then be uh, the aggressors during the second world war right so that's how this uh, place uh, you know or this uh, space in the in the play works symbolically uh i also said uh, one thing i mean uh, 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 in my first interpretation of uh, uh, this room we said that it is a de- it is a depiction of hell now you see uh, uh, on that account there's a very popular uh, phrase uh, by sartre which is oft quoted 
and it's also taken uh, you know that 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 kind of begin uh, becomes the source of this play um, uh, which is uh, hell is other people <laughs> that's what sartre says hell is other people now, it's a reference to sartre's ideas about the look and the perpetual uh, uh, ontological struggle of being caused to see oneself as an object from the view of another consciousness now i'm i'm sure that this is a very complicated idea for you to understand but let me just decode that when he says uh, hell is other people he is actually trying to give us a reference to the idea of being once again so when we say ontological struggle it means that the struggle to exist the the, the struggle to understand that what is it to be and in that struggle to understand what is it to be the idea of other people automatically comes in so hell is created when we look at ourselves or when our consciousness is mediated by how the others are viewing us so that's why he says hell is other people right so this becomes quite a uh, you know a seminal thing Uh, for uh, sartre's contribution to existentialism and if you remember in the previous lecture also we had said that uh, as existentialism you know explores the idea of being it explores that idea through the relationship that an individual has with others around right so um, so this is something that we uh, which is rightly uh, established uh, in the uh, uh, play uh, in its setting in its characters and also in this uh, space of the torture chamber which he depicts um, here uh from here i would like to move on to discussing uh, you know some of the ideas in the play on the basis of certain excerpts right and the first thing that we see is that uh, uh, dignity of these three people is under attack right these three people who were who of course sinned who've done uh, misdeeds when they were alive and uh, their dignity is uh, something which is now no longer available to them now garson says and let's let's look at this dialogue between garson and valet garson says now he is the first one to enter the the, the torture chamber and this is the observation that he makes uh, by the way another uh, thing to notice is that this torture chamber has no doors it is the, the, there is no door there is no window it's just like a box so imagine people being in such a space what does garson say no mirrors i notice no windows only to be expected and nothing breakable but damn it all they might have left me my toothbrush valet says that's good so you haven't yet got over your what do you call it sense of human dignity what does this tell you garson expected he said that there are no doors there are no windows there are no mirrors he said but at least i should have been given a toothbrush here and what does valet say valet says that this is even like the fact that you're even thinking of a toothbrush means that you still have a sense of human dignity which is attached to your uh, sense of self despite all the despicable things that you've done in your life so this space is supposed to be that space which which uh, yeah, which you know gives no room for dignity to exist because they have sinned so uh, you know grievously in their past right so um, we notice that this uh, that uh, human dignity is under attack and let's now connect this to what was actually happening around that time during the world war there was nobody who was sacred there were no ranks that were being uh, you know kind of acknowledged uh, dignity of uh, every individual was uh, in threat in fact did the idea of dignity even exist when when uh, people were fighting to just survive when people were at each other's uh, throat to kill one another without even knowing what's the reason for this entire uh, you know uh, 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 idea of war does the idea of dignity even come up that's something which sartre is somewhat hinting at when he gives us this idea that how human dignity has no space in this chamber connected to how people would be feeling at the time when this war was on we uh, we come to the second point which is that how the chamber is symbolic i've talked about it to an extent but let's also look at this from the play from this extract in the play where we say that the, that that this chamber is actually controlled by external authorities now garson says and i quote i assure you i'm quite conscious of my position 
Shall I tell you what it feels like? A man is drowning, choking, sinking by inches, till only his eyes are just above water. And what does he see? A bronze atrocity, as in a nightmare. That's their idea, isn't it? No, I suppose you're under orders not to answer questions and I won't insist. Here, two things are very, very important. First, when he describes his condition, he's choking. He feels that he's drowning. He feels that he's sinking by inches and his eyes are just about to be immersed in water. A sense of extreme helplessness is indicated over here. And that is something that Sartre wants us to think about. Is this what it means to be alive at that point of time? Is this what it means to be or to be in existence at a time when the world is crumbling around you? You feel that you're choking. You feel that you're drowning. You feel that you're sinking. Now, is this, now where is this feeling coming from? Is this feeling coming from one's, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the world that one is part of? Or is this feeling coming from the sins, so to say, quote-unquote, that this character has committed in the previous uh, birth? Your playwright will not answer that. He's leaving it for you to decode it. But these, all these possibilities are thrown up by the playwright. Yeah? And then, you know, when he also says that um, it's their idea to uh, have us here, what does the word there over there refer to? Who is there referring to? That the word there tells you that this chamber has a set of authorities which are controlling the people here. And this is what connects it to the second interpretation which I had given you, that how it comes across, this, this space comes across as uh, uh, symbolizing France during the Second World War, which was going through uh, a difficult reality and uh, because of uh, you know, uh, being mistreated by the others uh, like Germany, uh, uh, you know, uh, that was kind of uh, uh, incredibly fascist. So uh, one might debate that, you know, whether Italian fascism or German fascism was more brutal. But, uh, but all these ideas are packed into this kind of a symbolic representation of the chamber. A third thing, which, uh, a third idea which this play also talks about is life. It talks about life without a break. Yeah. And let's see what Garson at another point of the play says this. He says, ah, I see. It's life without a break. That's why there is something so beastly, so damn bad-mannered in the way you stare at me. They are paralyzed. It's like a small black shutter that clicks down and makes a break. Uh, everything goes black. One's eyes are moistened. You cannot imagine how restful, refreshing that is. 4,000 little rests per hour. 4,000 little respites. Just think. What is Garson talking about? He's talking about the idea of blinking. He says that when you blink, that blink is a rest. So if you're blinking 4,000 times, you're, you're taking those four, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, breaks in your life. Yeah. So just imagine thinking of existence as, uh, uh, you know, in these terms, very clearly tells us that how uh, for uh, people alive at that time, life uh, without a break seems to be so ghastly and that is represented through this character valley who doesn't blink the other uh, important uh, you know idea is that the play also talks about the dark troubled existence yeah how do we see that garson is seen as uh, the, you know a person who experiences 12 bullets uh, which are uh, run through his chest and that's how he dies yeah he says, sorry, I fear I'm not good company among the dead. She is waiting at the entrance of the barracks. She is his wife. She comes there every day, but they will not let her in. And now she is trying to peek between the bars. She does not know yet that I'm absent, but, the, but she suspects it. Now she's going away. She's wearing her black dress. So much the better. She won't need to change. Very dark reality. The man is dead. The wife does not know that he is dead. The wife does not know that he has 12 bullet wounds in him, but he is no longer alive. She comes to the barracks every day in hope of finding him there, but he's not there. So you see, another aspect of a very, very dark reality, which 
uh, Sartre brings out over here. Yeah. So we notice that uh, you know the idea of darkness, the idea of existence which is uh, not very clear, which is not very uh, you know happy, is bring about, is uh, is uh, brought about over here, right? And uh, one last thing that I would like to say, uh, uh, which is also you know uh, uh, talked about in this play, is the idea of hell. Hell, it's a it's a different kind of a hell. The hell over here is not a space, but the fact that these three people are there in the one space, they have nowhere to go. They just have these three people to be with each other. They have no hope uh, further. That is a living hell for them. There is no death. There is no torturer. It's just these three people. So you see, again, connected to the idea that how Sartre says hell is other people. So he is somewhat trying to say that, you know, the fact that how being becomes difficult, how survival becomes difficult. Who do we blame? We don't blame destiny. We do not blame transcendence. We blame the conditions, the conditions which have been created by our fellow individuals as well, uh, uh, our, our fellow individuals uh, uh, itself, right? So this is, these are very complex ideas which uh, Sartre somewhat throws up in the play and uh, we need to assimilate them, look at the play uh, uh, from this perspective that what is it trying to tell us about existence? It's a dark existence. It, it's an existence which... Um, uh, you know, uh, factors in different people and how all these, uh, you know, um, uh, ideas then help us understand the time when Sartre was also writing. Yeah. So the idea of hell, the idea of existence, the idea of darkness and also the idea of how consciousness of our own selfhood comes through others as if we exist when we are acknowledged by the others. Can we exist in isolation? These are some of the philosophical questions that this uh, play throws up and does not give decisive answers to. And that's why we say that, you know, uh, this play is one of the classic texts to think about the movement of um, uh, existentialism, right? So we've, in this lecture, looked at the setting of the play. We've looked at the characters of the play. We've looked at how the uh, one room setting is incredibly symbolic at two levels. And we've also seen what idea of existence and being comes through and how uh, the, the playwright suggests a lot and leaves a lot for us to interpret. I hope that you will pick up this play, read it still more and then um, understand what's the playwright trying to do. But one more thing that we must keep in mind that the play concludes with a sense of human compassion. So it is not a negative out and out negative world that Sartre is portraying. There is hope. And how is human compassion? There is an element of love which is indicated towards the end where we see two characters which are, uh, who are part of this uh, torture chamber. They actually hug each other. They hug each other. There is a sense of intimacy between each other. Right? Uh, uh, between the two characters. So having thrown up these very difficult questions about existence, Sartre does somewhat open a window for hope by showing human compassion, right? So that also then tells us about Sartre's own value system and what he would like to believe in. He will not like to, uh, you know, turn his eyes away from reality. But yes, he would also like to assert human compassion in the middle of this dark reality. Thank you. <laughs>